So, hello, uh, I'm Chris, and today I will try to convince you that if you are not using state machines, especially declarative state machines, you are probably missing out, and you're missing out both on performance and the design, uh, the declarative design. So, let's begin. So, what's the motivation for the talk? The motivation is to raise the awareness of the motivation is, sorry, can't hear me. Ah, okay. So, is that better? So, the motivation for this talk is to raise the awareness of everyone that the state machines can be actually uh, very useful and. Uh, uh, might be used in many contexts, although they have been kind of forgotten and have a lot of uh, negative associations due to the legacy. So a lot of developers think that the state machines are hard to use, they slow to compile and, and slow to run. But I'll try to, you know, re bust some of these misconceptions and uh, point out that uh, the state machines can be very useful to uh, implement an uh, application flow. So, all in all, I would say let's not be scared of state machines uh, as much as of these guys. Also, state machines, uh, as you know it, just a bit more complicated than the one which I'm, I'll be talking about. So, kind of on that topic, uh, State machines are really good and fit very well into C++ because of the they can leverage zero overhead abstractions and they're declarative. And they fit very well with the embedded domain as well. So if you haven't been on Michael talk yesterday, uh, you missed out a lot. So you should go back in time and go and watch it live. Uh, so regarding the state machines on their own. I don't know how familiar are you with the Skynet source code. Uh, I'm not that much, but I would kind of uh, say that the Skynet on its own was just a software glitch. And the reason for it that my claim, that is my personal claim, was that the Skynet wasn't implemented using declarative state machines. So so yeah, that's the, you know, the motivation for the talk and that's why we will go through a lot of examples how we can actually improve the design using the state machines. So the outline here is that we'll introduce a small problem. We, sorry, it's like, uh, I would love to implement Skynet with you, but uh, we don't have enough time for that and I don't have enough skills to do it either. Uh, we'll take a look into the state machine wallet what it is about, uh, what we can do with that. And then we will take a look into the solutions, the different solutions to implement, uh, in implement them. We'll, do, we'll take a look into the naive ones. Uh, we'll take a look into STL. We can you know, use modern STL to implement state machines and also the boost libraries. After that, we will compare and you know, kind of conduct a battle between them, see which ones are good for uh, for what, what the trades of are, and we'll sum it up. Just a small remark, if anything is a dark blue background, it's something to remember, something which I found important when I was uh, preparing for the talk. So, remember about that. So, what's the problem? So, a lot of applications are using, for example, the connection, TCP, UDP, so let's dig with something which is very familiar to everyone. So the feature would be the connection. Let's say product owner come, come to us and give us the, the requirements for it. So we can take a look into it from like behavior driven development, acceptance criteria. We have a scenario which uh, we would like to, our product owner would like us to satisfy. So given I don't have a connection, when I receive a request to connect and I I should try to establish the connection and when I receive the 
acknowledgement, I should have been connected. Also, I'm very easy, right? Uh, and we get other, other features as well, like disconnect, reconnect, and so on. So, so the idea here, and that's the way the talk would be approached, that we'll try to find and go through different approaches to find what's the best uh, design from the readability perspective, what will be the most maintainable approach towards implementing it, and the most efficient as well, because we, we're talking about zero overhead C++. Make sense? OK. So what is the state machine? So in principle, state machines are very simple abstractions, you know, combined from uh, multiple states, finite state, but we can only be in one at a given time. They also implemented, and you know, like C++ have a standard. State machines also have a, their own standard. I would even say that it's very similar to C++ in a variety of ways. Uh, it's quite boring to read, uh, for example, but it's less precise, so it's even worse uh, than C++ standard. But there is a standard for it, so I think that's good. Uh, if anyone is willing to read it, mm, that's the link. The current specification is UML 2.5, and it's with kind of a picture uh, approach towards state machines. So, so let's say we have this feature requirements from, mm, from someone who we are willing to implement. And the state machine abstraction from the UML perspective would look something like that. So that would be a, a, a UML diagram which represents our features. If we take a look closer into that, we'll see that the connection is combined of states. We have the initial state, which is on the top left. Uh, actually, I may use that one. Here, which is the, you know, dot. After that, we have disconnected state, and we have this transition to connecting. And that's, uh, that's kind of important to understand that the transition is something where we change the state mm, given an event, a guard, which is the condition on which, whether it's satisfied, we will call the action and change the state to the destination state. If the guard is not satisfied, the action won't be called and we won't change the state. So uh, if you take a look into the connection state machine, we'll see that there are three states here. There are some transitions between them, uh, which <coughs> sort of makes sense. Uh, it's not obviously like TCP implementation, but I guess it's a very simplified one which describe uh, the feature which we were given uh, to implement. Make sense? So something to remember is that the state machines are more than just simple transitions. So in, in, in the example I will show the connection, it will be a very simple example and we can implement, because we, this way I, I was able to implement it in many different ways, otherwise I would I would really struggle to put it on the slides. However, the state machines are more complex than that. So that's, for example, example, more complex example of a system state machine where part of it is the connecting. So you can imagine if you look at the Skynet kind of picture, the state machine for, you know, these guys would be way more complex than that. So I just wanted to uh, bring to your attention that state machines are, are quite diffi might be quite complex in general. <coughs> so let's dig into the solutions. So what solutions which we actually are going to look at? So we have naive kind of way of doing state machines, if else, uh, I guess everyone was there. Sweet genome, a small improvement, not much. Uh, state pattern, when we get to the object-oriented design, we go for that, especially when we were taught Java, for example. And after that, we can, we'll take a look into STL. So C++17 gave us a variant, which might be used for implementing state machines, uh, simple ones, the coroutines, which is a you know, new brand 
idea for implementing state machines as well. Not only, but uh, they can be implemented using curtains. And we will also take a look into some boost libraries, which are some boost libraries and some non uh, boost libraries. Like SML is not a boost library, but uh, we'll take a look into that. OK, so at first, let's uh, you know, uh, have a common ground what is kind of the same between all of the solutions. Events. Events will be just simple structs. That's the way we'll trigger uh, our state machines with the process event, which is just the, uh, the interface API for all of them, so that we can keep them uh, very simple. There'll be a guard, is valid, <laughs> which will return a true in our case, but will take an event so that we can show how to implement uh, guards in all of them. And after that, we'll have actions, and we'll just try to uh, print something uh, uh, in them so that they, they, they won't be fully optimized away when we will compare the assembly output. So naive implementation. Let's take a look into if else. I guess everyone was there at some point. Uh, if not, I'm quite jealous, actually. I was there. So usually when we start with uh, naive implementation, we'll put some Boolean variables on, on our state, which are implicit, uh, because maybe we are not aware that, oh, that's a state machine. It's not obvious for us at, uh, at that time. But it's quite uh, obvious when you, when, you, when you see the state machine later on. Yeah, there's a question. Const, whether there should be a const bool in our heads. Well, they may change uh, because we can be in one state, but it's like. After it's connecting, I was thinking that was one of the states. So right. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll actually go back to that solution in a second uh, with the enum. So, so, so the idea is that we have a process event, it takes an event, uh, and then we have condition if, con if disconnected, we will go to establish. Uh, we'll call establish action, and after that we'll have to, you know, do some magic with the all implicit states using the variables to to understand which state we are in. Uh, obviously, that's not ideal because you can imagine that it it quickly will get out of the control when we have tons of them. And if you see the code which has if a and b and not c or d, well, yeah, you don't want to maintain that, right? So that's a good uh, indicator that state machine would be useful there. <laughs> and that's the implementation for the second part of ping, for example. We verify that we connected, we, we put the guard uh, in place, and then there is a timeout. We stay in the same state, so we don't change any of our, our variables. Make sense? Nothing special. So what's good about that solution? When we take a look into the Assembly output, it's very well optimized, so it's inline. It's a simple, it's a simple thing, but it's like not all the solutions will be inline. So, uh, so that's good. So that's good. We can see that uh, uh, from all this uh, assembly uh, code, we can see that only established and reset timeout uh, are being produced, uh, and we have these calls to the put uh, function to to print them out. So that's like fully inline. That's whole main is uh, basically. Uh, not a lot of lines, 20 lines, uh, and interface for uh, for that uh, connection output is just a process event for connect, establish ping, disconnected, connect, establish ping. So, so we'll follow the same approach towards all of them so that we can compare different solutions. And it's also just 60 lines of code, not terrible, but not ideal either. So just to sum up, it's inline, good. There's no heap usage. That's good. There is not much memory being used. There's no heap allocation. But we use three bytes instead of one, for example, because we have three booleans. Not ideal. It's hard to reuse. We don't want to deal with all of them, uh, all of them variables. And you know, it might be a good idea to have eight spaces for tabs if you're doing that, so that you won't get too far away. Uh, but sometimes you, you may go out too far. So something to remember that we don't, 
this solution is not necessarily the best one. So state machines can be easily identified by implicit states. So when we have things like that, most likely we would benefit from having some sort of state machine instead. So, you know, we learn a bit about C++, so we, we know that we can easily switch to the state uh, enum instead. Uh, and then we will be able to be only in one state at a given time. So that's more like the state machine implementation uh, idea. So we start from disconnected. And we have a switcher case here. When we process the event, it's basically the same solution as before. Uh, in the default statement, we just break. Otherwise, we change the state. And here, what is good about that solution is that we won't uh, make the mistake that if we don't set one of the variables, uh, 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 then, you know, because in the previous solutions, we could have two states being true, two Boolean variables being true, which, which would be a bug. So here, that won't happen. Uh, so that's a bit better. So that's, I would assume that, you know, a step in the right direction, but we still have the same problems uh, as before if it comes to the usability and maintainability of that solution. Uh, however, optimized version is pretty good as before. So that's good. So, so this code is inlined, good. It, it has better memory footprint, also good. No heap usage, it's hard to reuse though, as before. It's kind of like when we, you know, quickly implement it and after that spend tons of time debugging what is going on. So not necessarily what we want to deal with. So yet another approach, when we started to learn about object-oriented design and we, you know, started to interact with some Java developers, we go to the design patterns. One of the design patterns to implement state machines is a state pattern, very commonly used. The idea is that we have an interface in which we, for example, for the state, in which we will implement the process event for each event uh, transition which we can have. So the implementation here is related to the uh, object-oriented design. We'll have a state representing uh, the different transitions. So for example, for disconnect, we'll hide it from the state and we'll have the uh, connect uh, process event for it in which we'll establish and after that we'll have some magical function to change the state to a different one, which will basically s set some uh, pointer uh, in our uh, class. And it's very similar to uh, connected, we'll do the same without changing the state. So regarding that solution, uh, well, because we have to use Bitable and although we have devirtualization and consexpr uh, virtual calls, well, it's unlikely it will be fully optimized away. Uh, we'll have these Bitable calls, indirect calls. We had to write a bit more because 100 lines of code and the assembly is worse than before. So it's not ideal, but the good part of it is the fact that we can easily extend our state machines because we don't have to change the whole code. We can do it from the state perspective. So that's good. It's object-oriented. But we have the heap allocations. We are not in, in line in that case. Yeah, there's a question. So you say it's easy to extend. Am I right in saying it's easy to add states but not easy to add events? Right. So the comment is uh, that it's easier to add the states, however, not the events. That's totally true. We can easily extend our states, but if you have to add the events, it's even more painful unless we won't handle them in specific states. We don't have to extend those. So all in all, it's uh, sluggish, Java-ish, uh, not maybe the best C++, not not the modern C++. And we know that it's using inheritance and that's, you know, as always, the base class of evil. Follow Sean Parentog to know more about it. So in C++ 17 and 20, we, we gain 
uh, new ways of implementing state machines, which are more exciting uh, than the old uh, style and naive style. So let's dig into that. Variant. Uh, <coughs> variant is very useful for, for implementing state machines, the, the simple ones, because it's a you know, type safe union in which only one state might be active, and we can have data towards uh, uh, in in any of the of the states so and we'll want you know the 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 footprint of the memory will be the minimal one so so all of that is really good and has good properties for for the state machines and after that when we process we'll have to do you know a bit of magic we'll have to do the visit on one of the states we have this overload coming uh, so when we Overload on disconnected, we'll go to establish and we change the state. Otherwise, we just don't do anything. Make sense? And it's the same in, in the pink case. We get, uh, we verify whether we are in the connected, we put the guard through, if it's satisfied, we reset the timeout and stay in the state. So what about the variant? Variant is quite interesting if it comes to performance because we can't control the underlying implementation of the variant. Uh, so it will be whatever the mm, you know, library authors provide. So for example, variant is well optimized with C++, libc++ in, in, in that case. It's basically inline. However, it's not that well optimized with GCC and lib standard C++. So, mm, Kind of a bummer, but that's what we have to deal with, and you never know because uh, you can't control that. However, variant is pretty good improvement to the solution we have already. The main improvement, I, I believe, is the fact that the memory footprint of it will be the you know the min the max size of all the events, and we can put different things into into our our, our event uh, our state. Sorry. And it integrates very well with uh, kind of returning uh, errors. So we can use like STDS accept or uh, things like that to report an errors from, from the state machines which we couldn't do before as easy. So, so variant has benefits. It's inlined on Clang. It's not inlined on GCC, so... Which version did you try? Uh, the newest one, Clang, and also 8 and 7. So, and it's uh, maybe not that related to GCC, it's more related to libs to uh, C++. Uh, I believe, I don't know if you could, uh, but if you tried GCC with libc++, maybe you, you would get the inline version. Or if you use any other variant library, like MyQuest library, to do, uh, which uses the switch, uh, to dispatch the events underlying, underlying, uh, in the underlying implementation, then it, it will be inline. But by default, it does not. So uh, you would have to, you know, be careful of which implementation you're using. Okay. And we still have the same kind of issues because it's hard to reuse with the uh, states and events because it's like Sweden, you know, it's just a nicer, nicer, more fancy way of doing it. So. Let's dig into the fun part, uh, coroutines. That's kind of changing the, the, the thinking of how to deal with C++. So let's just uh, revise what they are. Everyone is familiar with coroutines? Uh, not everyone, I'd say. Uh, actually, less than everyone. So, so just, to, just to quickly revise, because I actually don't have time to go through it, and I'm not an expert either way. So, so coroutines are kind of an expansion uh, on the function interface. They're called resemble, resemble functions. And you, you can think of them as a functions on steroids. Because by default functions, when they're called, they're done. They return something and you can't go back to them. But with coroutines, you can actually uh, resume them at any point of the function, you actually left them and suspend. So you can imagine that you go to the function, you go, go, go somewhere, 
and you decided that you don't know what to do uh, later on, so you suspend yourself, uh, everything is put on heap, sometimes stack, usually heap, and then you can go back when you know what to do with it or someone triggered you to do something and you can resume from that point where you actually suspend that. So you're not going from the beginning of the function, if that makes sense. So it's not like we call the same function always from scratch, we get to the point where we suspended the function before. So it's kind of magic. We go back to the place where we left off. Make sense? It's pretty cool, actually. And the idea here is that when you process event, we store it because uh, it's hard to use the coroutines with kind of generic code, and we'll resume. So, uh, so the resume is the like, kind of a coroutine where we you know, trigger our implementation, which we'll see in, in, in one second. So the common event type, and that's the curtain handle. It's an implementation detail, but we won't get into that at all. So, so let's try to implement the state machine which we had with our uh, coroutines. So the first thing is like, let, let's assume we have a function. The first thing we start from is a for infinite loop. Uh, that's already different than, uh, than before, right? And after that, why we have to do that? Because if we go to the second line and we do this co wait, which is the new keyword in C20, that's when we will suspend or resume. So co wait uh, will return something uh, if there is something to, if, we, if our function was resumed, we'll get the event and the data, we'll verify whether the event is connect, and we'll call establish. And why we need the for loop? Because if, the, if we are resumed, but the event is not connect, we want to stay in the same state. So we don't want to you know, transition. So we kind of go back to the for loop, but that won't be you know, hot loop, because we'll call call wait, and there is nothing in, and we get suspended again. So you, you kind of have to change the idea how you think about that function, that we will stay, will stay in the position of the function. So this call await in is where we will be back to, or we suspend or resume, if that makes sense. So then, that was for disconnected, that, that was the disconnected loop. And after that, we go to another loop where we connect in. We do the same thing. Uh, and if we established, otherwise we'll go back to the loop again. We go to yet another loop, which, is, which means that we are connected. And when we verify it event, it again, we will get resumed. And if you have the ping, we can do there is a timeout and we'll go to end to break the double loops uh, if they go to, because why not? Since we have a one function and every f the state, the important part here is that the state is represented by the position in the function. And we always come back to that position uh, where we resume. Uh, when, when we are resumed. Make sense? It's a bit different approach than we used to, but I think it's uh, quite neat if you do it uh, a bit differently. What about the, uh, the performance? So big thank you to Lois Baker who helped me improve that version so that it's actually inlined. Uh, by default, what I implemented uh, and I really tried, I have to say, I didn't really try to get it in line, but I couldn't because it was allocating and usually you can't really control the, uh, the coroutines, how to, you know, the backend will work, uh, but that tricks to, to make it happen. So, so it's ki kind, of, kind of in line in that case. So it's not as good as in, in case of the switch and if else, but it's still better than, for example, with the state pattern. So yeah, we like that. So, so the good thing is that we can use the structured C++ code we all know and, and you know, kind of go back and implement state machines using it. It's very handy for like TCP uh, connections and other things. And we can easily switch to the uh, asynchronous version as well. So that's pretty good. There's a learning curve, curve here. So uh, it's not that easy to think about them. Uh, 
as of the you know procedural code or object oriented code. But if we get into that, uh, I guess we can get the gist of, of it uh, and use them. Most likely it will require a heap at some point, so I wouldn't use them in you know high frequency trading, for example, because you never know what you will get out of it. Uh, if you could control that, maybe, uh, but since we can't, uh, I wouldn't advise you to rely on the performance of them. We have these implicit states, which is a good and bad, it depends how you look at it. Uh, it's positioned in the function, so it's a bit different than, uh, than having an explicit state, but, but it's something. And the minus here is that we require the common type uh, for the events because we return it from the from the coroutine. So we cannot return anything like a, a, a type. We, we have to return something, a, a common base. And in that particular example, the, the for loops are quite weird. So not ideal. So I'll actually gone a bit further with that. Uh, maybe not in the right direction. But uh, as an experiment, I was thinking, well, these for loops are not great, I don't like them as much. So what about go to? I wanted to make the states explicit. How to make the states explicit in, in a coroutine where the state is, a, you know, a position in the function? Well, you make a label, I guess. So you can actually do that and it's the same implementation as before, just instead of the four in infinite fours, we have go to's and the labels. Uh, so we can basically, you know, just do go to a different position in that function and get mad after a while. But yeah, it's possible. Uh, whether that's better or worse than the previous solution, well, I'm not the. I have strong opinion about go to, but I don't want to get into that. So it's it's possible, however, and it's explicit about the state. What about the performance? The performance didn't change much. Its state might be inlined. Uh, so maybe it's a positive of the go to. It's like it doesn't screw the performance here. I don't know. Uh, we still have quite a bit of code to implement, but, but it's not bad. So what about them? We don't have these infinite loops. That's good. We have explicit states. Whether that's good or bad depends on what we actually wanted to achieve. Sometimes it's better to have implicit states because we don't care about them. But sometimes I guess it's better to have explicit states when you want to transit to uh, specific ones and have the more explicit declarative way of dealing with them. We have go to, and you all know the story with go to. So uh, it most likely will never end up uh, good for f for anyone in the long term. Uh, so yet another you know, extension to the coroutines approach, which I took, is to combine the coroutines with the functions and the variant. So, so let's take a look into that. So the state will be a function here. Instead of having one function and go to the for loops, uh, I thought it's like, well, we can have different functions representing different states. Why not? That, that sounds like an improvement on the design. And the events here will be represented by the variant of, of them. So that's a bit different than we used to have before, because usually the first class citizens were the states. Here we treat uh, states as a function. So, 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 so the main idea is behind the events here. Uh, so that's, that's what I just said, basically. So, so it's a bit different, uh, but I believe that's actually better than the previous solution. So let's take a look. So we have this disconnected uh, function. Sorry, we still have to have this for loop because we can go to the go to, but we actually can't go to the go to as well because we would have to jump between the functions. Uh, I don't think we want to do long jumps and stuff like that. So uh, we have a for loop, and then we can, you know, ask the variant. Uh, uh, whether we are in, uh, whether we got this event or not, and the basic idea here to sta to change the state is just to co-return, which is another keyword from C++ plus twenty coroutines, to a different function. So then this function uh, uh, will be suspended and will go to a different one, 
and will resume depending on which, which function we are in. So we'll have one uh, state coroutine which will point to one of the functions and uh, kind of a position into that function. It's kind of uh, uh, difficult to imagine but uh, that's the way actually it works. Uh, it's kind of implicit from, fr from our perspective. And then we have a connected state which is also a function. We have this for loop. We, we co-await when we resume. <laughs> we can verify which uh, event it was, we call the guard, and we can go to a different functions depending on which uh, event it was and whether the guards were satisfied. So I guess that design is a bit better than the before uh, because of uh, it's more declarative, more expressive. What about uh, the performance? The performance is not as good because we have the new, that's probably from the variant and the placement new, but all in all the generated code is a bit worse. So there are positives of using it because we have the functions, so it's easier to add new states. We have type safe events, we have dynamic allocations, so that's not as good. And that's kind of all in all for the coroutines. It's ca kind of difficult to make them right. And you might be bitten by them quite often. Uh, but, but maybe it will work for you. I don't know, there are trades off. So let's take a look into boost libraries uh, which implement state machines. So there is a reason why we want to implement uh, state machines in the library space. It's because, as I pointed out bef before, there's just more than just simple transitions. We have like composite state, history, orthogon ortho orthogonal regions and stuff like that, which are defined in the UML standard. And if you want to follow all of them, well, most likely a variant won't provide that for us, neither coroutines. We'll have to write that in, in some kind of a library. So we'll take a look into free libraries, boost state chart, which was part in the boost from the quite long time which has kind of a dynamic approach, MSM, which I really like, uh, but it's a bit outda outdated, and SML, which I wrote, and it's not a boost library, so it's a boost library uh, with the quotes, uh, but it kind of improves on, on, on the MSM. So let's take a look into state chart. So state chart is kind of like the state pattern implementation or in boost. Uh, it requires dynamic allocations. It's kind of slow and implements UML 1.5. So it's not the most modern approach and the most modern library. However, uh, it's useful to switch to it if you using the state pattern all over the place. So how we deal with that library? We have to implement the states uh, with you know some common event type in the state chart which is required and the actions and the guard are part of the state machine kind of the, the state machine itself the connection here is the context uh, not not the best design in my opinion but that's the way it is and the disconnected is the initial state here on the on the right side of the co connection is the kind of CRTP thing here so then uh, we can implement the states States are the first class citizens here. We, we inherit from simple state. Uh, and then we'll set the reactions. So there's like a transition. We have the list of the transition. When we have the connect event, we'll go to the connecting state. Connection is just the uh, state machine so that we can pass the context. And after that, we call the establish function. Uh, it's quite uh, difficult to use, but uh, it is possible uh, to deal with that library if, you, if you're familiar with it. We can also have the custom reaction on the bottom. So that's when we want to call the, the guards. Uh, and then uh, we can just react in, in C++ where it will just be called on the React function, where we get the context of the state machine, we verify the, uh, the guard, and we can, you know, call different calls on the state machines. 
So it's kind of coupled to the to the connection as, as being context. Uh, if it comes to performance, well, not great, much worse even than the state pattern. Uh, you can see there's like 2,000 lines of assembly, uh, tons of allocations, not great. So it implements UML, so it's better than the state pattern. Uh, there's a learning curve here, but we have dynamic allocations, dynamic dispatch, high memory footprint, and all in all, it's not that good. So Boost actually have one more library, which is called MSM, and I'm going to refer to the, it has different front ends, but one of the uh, best, in my opinion, is the U EUML, which kind of reflects the UML uh, uh, notation. However, it's kind of macro-based, which is not that great. Uh, yeah, you, you have a really good talk here about macros and go-tos. Uh, but yeah, sorry about that. So, so MSM is using uh, some macros to define the event, uh, events, some other macros to define states, uh, still not ideal. However, oh, sorry, some other macros to define actions and guards. But when we go get through all of those macros, we'll get the juice out of it, which is the transition table, which is the most powerful concept of MSM, I believe, because it's very similar to the way we would like to write the code when we want to be very really declarative and uh, use the potential of UML. So here you can read it as, uh, as, as being in this connected state on the first line. When we get the connect event, we call the established action and, going and we go to connecting. So when you, when you get the grasp of uh, what it's actually doing, the abstract way, I think it's very, very easy to follow. Make sense? And then we have to do some macros to define the initial state and, and whatever, and more stuff. What about the performance? So Boost MSM is well performing. However, the only policy which we have on uh, using it is the jump table. So it will generate jump table at compile time between all the uh, possible events and state transitions. And after that, the runtime will just jump. So it, 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 it's very well performing uh, if, it, if it comes to that. However, we can't switch uh, how we want to deal with it. So in the summary, it's declarative. That's good. It's kind of like UML. It has O1 dispatch using jump table. It has UML2 features, small memory footprint. There's a learning curve because we have to deal with all these macros. It has DSL. I think that's good because it's nice and easy. And it's macro-based, not great. But the main problem is that it's really slow to compile. So I actually have to switch to my own Compiler Explorer version to be able to compile it uh, and show you the results. Uh, so that's not ideal. It takes forever to compile big state machines. And the error messages are, are quite bad as well because of all the TMP. And that's coming from the fact that it's implemented using MPL still. Uh, but yeah, all in all, it's not that bad. <coughs> so what about SML? SML is my take on the state machines, and I try to improve the MSM because I've been happy. I've been ha a happy user of MSM for a while, but when I switched to more complex state machines, uh, uh, I just couldn't deal with the compilation times and with all these macros. So I thought we can do a bit better. So SML is a simple library, it's just two lines, two, well, not two lines. Uh, 2,000 lines of code, the single header, there are no requirements, no boost, no, no STL, so it's very, you know, embedded development friendly. There are no, like, no virtuals, no RTTI, no exceptions required. And C++14 supports all of these compilers, all goodies and juicy stuff. So what's about the implementation? So it's also based on the transition table idea, so that we can see all the transitions 
in one place, because I think that's an important concept of the state machines. And, and that's basically all of it. So we have a connection. We start with the star, which is the disconnected state. Uh, and when we go to the event connect, we call the established action, which is the lambda, which we define in the beginning. And we go to the connecting state. So all of that is, I think, quite easy to, to grasp. I don't know whether you agree with me. Is that readable? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Uh, audience as well. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a question though. Is the underscore s the standard string underscore s or an SML specific underscore s? It's SML specific. S not underscore. Right. So the comment here underscore s it's reserved uh, like not underscore is reserved for STL underscore s it's not and it's SML specific thing. Uh, it's actually using, it's because it's just to have the unique type for the TMP magic which is happening underneath uh, when using that. So how we get there? So uh, we have this connection state machine on the left. We can easily translate it to the rows kind of thing when you think about disconnected uh, and the transition to connecting. We can write it in, in you know, in a specific rows instead of having like all the state machine at once. Uh, so this transformation is one to one. And when you have this transformation using the, uh, the transition here, we can actually basically show that. That's kind of like a UML approach. So that's basically the same as on the right side, disconnected, connect, establish, connecting, just in text instead of pictures. Right? We see the similarity between those guys on the right, disconnected, connecting, connecting, connected. If you take a look into those two guys, we can see basically the same uh, thing just in text instead of pictures. So if you follow that, we'll actually end up with this one if we try to get into the C world. It's not it's not, you know, 100%, but I guess it's really close. And, and that's what we like, right? Being cl as close and as declarative as we can. So we like that. I like it. I hope you'll like it too. So there's a power of declarative design here, which, which I think it's important to, uh, to grasp. We express what, not how. A and that's important because uh, usually when we implement state machines and we will have these underlying implementations which are, you know, if-else or switch in uh, driven, at some point not being declarative will, uh, will bite us and we will pay for that in the future when we try to uh, maintain that. But having the powerful declarative design can give us actually a few other benefits. So for example, we can easily uh, generate the diagram. For example, that's a diagram for the connection using planned UML. Everyone familiar with planned UML? It's kind of text-based thing to generate diagrams. Uh, if, you if you haven't used that one, uh, you can take a look into it. So the idea is that we have some DSL, not in C++, but in day language in which we can describe the state machine. And after that, uh, when we, you know, pass it through the planned UML implementation, uh, we'll get a picture. So how can we implement that uh, using SML? So if we add a planned UML a function, which will be a uh, when we pass the state machine into it, uh, it's quite simple. We can verify that the TSML, sorry, it's not T, TSM, uh, what is initial state, we just print the, the star uh, and try to be compatible with the planned UML interface. We, we print the source state. And after that, uh, 
we put just the names. So we can get the names out of the, out of the strings which we had. Uh, and then we get that one uh, when we run the plant UML. So actually all the diagrams here which I used are generated using uh, this approach. Uh, so actually it was easier for me to write it in C++ in SML and generate the diagram than actually write the diagram. So I guess that's positive. Uh, I don't know actually. Uh, it depends how we approach the, the idea, right? Whether you start from the diagram and go to the code or go, or go from the code to the diagram just to visualize whether you get it right. But I guess that, that's quite neat. Uh, uh, you like it? It's good? Uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's always good to have some visualization which can be done easily, I think. There's a question? I just had a question on your notation on your the guard. Uh, what's the meaning of the uh, vertical bar and the forward slash? Vertical bar and the forward. You mean? Those are brackets. You mean this one? Okay, sorry. Yeah, so so that's uh, that's related to to this part. Forward slash. Yeah. So so th uh, that's uh, related to yeah. So when we look into the transition here, that's defined by the UML uh, notation. So if you revise that again, we have the source state. Then we have the event, which is the you know the trigger to whether we want to uh, transition from the source state to destination state. We have the guard, which is in the square brackets, which means that we will have a you know, callable fin which takes the event and, the, and if it's true, if it returns true, we'll call the actions, so that's forward slash and action, uh, and we'll go to the destination state. If the guard is not satisfied, uh, we won't call the action and we won't go to the destination state. Uh, so that's the notation. Uh, it's, it's defined by the UML, so I didn't invent it, uh, neither M MSM. But I'm happy that it, it uses the operators we can actually overload. <laughs> so, uh, so that's good for us from the C++ perspective. Make sense? So if you go back to our diagram generation, we get that one. So, but SML is not about just being declarative. It's also important to be able to tune your performance because we care about the performance. There are overhead abstractions, right? That's all C++ is about. It's about not having a Lamborghini and be in the traffic. Uh, if, you, if you consider that a traffic, I don't know. Uh, so we don't want to pay for what we don't use. That's the C++ way of thinking, and that's what we want. So SML actually allows us to change the policy, dispatch policy, so that we can tweak uh, the generated assembly code for our needs, because depending on our application. We always have to measure, but if we can't change the underlying implementation, we won't be able to, to, to change anything either way. So there are a few dispatch policy and might be, might be more. I was thinking that coroutines might be one of them as well, which would be interesting to see. Uh, so there, there are five uh, which uh, are in at the moment. Jump table, switch, else, if else, and default expressions. So you can see that like the three of them we already kind of see. So if else and nested switch we implemented naively already, but it's like if you can have something which is more declarative and it generates the switch else and if else without any bugs, I think that's better. The jump table was used by the MSM, but that's the only one which can be used there. So let's check it out. So that's the input interface to the dispatch policy. It's not very that important to see uh, all the details from it, but the idea is that we just do the linear search of the state, we go through all the states which we know at compile time because all of that is like TMP uh, generated. So we know all the states and everything at compile time. 
And after that, we can just simply verify whether the current state here uh, is, the, is, is the one which we're looking for based on the ID. And if it's not, we recursively call the same function uh, with less states and try to find the state which we are interested in. Make sense? So what kind of code that generates? So it's the SML implementation. It's the same as uh, if else, surprise, surprise. Uh, uh, we can actually have abstractions in C++, which are zero overhead. We like that. So the way we change the policy is uh, on line 32 on the left side, we just say, I want this policy instead of the other one. What about switch else? We can actually generate switch else with a, a, a trick, basically. It's basically the same as before. We do the switch instead of the if else. If we find the value, great, we execute. If we don't find the value, we go to the default statement and we call the function again with you know, less elements, one less, because we you know, remove the head and go back to the switch. Uh, so it's kind of a nested switch in which the default case will be you know, propagated with uh, the next set of events until we'll find it or we'll go to the last default case in which the event is not satisfied. Make sense? So that's actually optimized as well uh, by GCC and Clang. It, didn't, it wasn't optimized that well by GCC uh, a year ago, but right now, nested switch, it's, it's, it's seen through by GCC compiler, and it's flattened out, and it produced the same code as, as normal switch else, which is written not in this weird recursive way, because we wouldn't write the switch else like that, right? We wouldn't go to the second case in the default one, and so on. So what about jump table? It's very similar to other solutions. We just generate a static jump table because uh, we will only access that, uh, uh, that jump table from the same templates parameters. There's never uh, any other case. And we will just execute, we, we will have the execute calls based on the state and event which, which are passed through. And after the, the runtime, we can just uh, jump to the current state and pass through the event, which is basically just a simple jump table, assuming that we know everything at compile time. And that generates different type of code, uh, which is more uh, jumpy wise, but it's inlined in, in Clang, uh, which is uh, which is surprising, it's not that in line in GCC, but it doesn't matter because uh, jump table will have different characteristics either way. We'll take a look into benchmarks and then, you know, more assembly not in line, it doesn't mean worse performance. It may mean that, it's a good sign, but it doesn't mean that always. And the last but not least, it will be the fold expressions. So C++ 17, it's very similar to basically to have if else linear search we just go through all the uh, all the states verify the id and do that uh, until we'll find one or not it is just nicer and fancier way and that's short circuiting so we want that so fold, fold expressions are really nice uh, if it comes to that and that generates exactly the same code as if else so we all like fold expressions they're good So to sum up the policies, uh, they allow us to tweak the performance, which I think it's very beneficial from a uh, state machine perspective, and especially if you care about the performance. And I assume we care because we are C++ developers. So, so that's good. But we always have to remember to measure, because that depends on, on our end-to-end -end product. Which policy is the best uh, always depends. Uh, we I have some defaults in SML for GCC and Clang, uh, but that's based on you know just 
uh, experience and the test I made, but it doesn't mean it will be the best for you. So it's always good to measure and measure in production like environment and switch it accordingly to whatever is the best for you. And one more thing about the state machines. I, I was pointing out like uh, SML. Well, I was pointing out that it's like they are not just about simple transitions. We compared simple transitions because it's easy to compare and we can actually compare that because otherwise uh, I would have really hard time to implement this guy in if else without uh, and showing that on the slides. Uh, but I can show you an implementation of this state machine, which is more complex than the previous one in SML, just to see that state machines are just not about the transitions. So we have the system class, and uh, we have the, the disconnect connection as before. Uh, however, we don't use the initial state, we use the history state. And history state from UML perspective is a state in which we will come back to. It's kind of like uh, coroutines. So we will, st we will keep uh, somewhere the information in which state was active the last time, and we come back to that state machine. Uh, that'll be the one which we'll get back to. So it, it's uh, because by default, we'll always go back to the initial state uh, if that's uh, what is defined. So that's good. And after that, the second part, where it was the idle, we have the event, we have some actions. And you can see also that the, from the UML perspective, the state might be uh, another state machine. So therefore, you have like these super states or composite states, depends how you look at it. Uh, and you can you know, have a huge hierarchical state machines uh, and complex uh, mm, expressions of the application flow. So, so just to point out that you know, state machines are more than just simple transitions. And also, you can see here this line. It means that we have two different regions, and they are quite a pseudo parallel executed. So the watchdog is not related to the idle state machine. So they, they're working in parallel to, to, to show you that. We can look into that one. You can see that the watchdog is not related to the other state machine, but it's part of the system. Uh, and that's very com a very common use case, in especially in embedded development. Uh, so that's really easy to implement with the state machines if you have an expressive way of doing them. And you can check it online if you want. You can click that one. So the summary, declarative, expressive, good. Customizable, if it comes to performance, good. At compile time, even better. Inline uh, performance, because it's customizable either way. So that's good. Fast compilation times, that's something we didn't look at uh, yet. We'll, we'll go to the benchmark in a second. But uh, when I was comparing MSM to SML, it's like it could compile up to 60 times faster. Uh, it's basically not much worse than uh, if else written by hand. So that's good. Uh, it has UML, two or five features. There's no much memory footprint. So all of that, the states are just a labels, uh, types, basically, a string. It's, it's not a string, it's just a type which has string in it. So the size of the, the, the state machine is just one byte uh, because we can't get less. Uh, There's a learning curve uh, as usual. However, if you are quite expressive and declarative, the learning curve is, a, I believe, it's smaller. And it's DSL-based which I found really good, but some people don't like it because you overlap the operators and uh, do TMP magic, so uh, it's your choice. So, any questions regarding this part of the talk, the solutions, uh, anything uh, which I didn't check or didn't point out? Yes? Right, so, so uh, thank you for that question. The question is how we handle errors in case of SML or in case of 
In case of SML, yeah, so we can enable the exceptions handling, uh, in which case you, instead of uh, having an event like uh, plus event, you can have unexpected uh, like ex exception and then say std error for example and then you can act on it uh, that ways in, in principle there are ways of handling errors does that answer your question yep. okay so let's dig into the benchmarks the goodies uh, so action guards will just have the optimize not optimized away methane and after that, we'll generate some events up front so that we won't pay or for the, you know, one million events up front so that we won't pay at runtime uh, the cost of generating them so that we can actually measure something. And we'll use uh, the newest compilers I, I had access to at that time. We'll use t to a flag. We'll compare here Clang mostly because the coroutines are implemented in Clang. They, they're sort of implemented in ECC, but I didn't check them yet. But they were better optimized in Clang, so, so that was the comparison. And GCC doesn't, as you've seen, doesn't change much if it comes to performance. The tools I used, uh, Linux Perf, Colgrind, Google Benchmarks, and Godbolt, just to get the get the results. If you haven't used any of them, really advise you to. It's really good for, for the f to have them in your, in, in your bucket. So the first thing which I compared was lines of code. Less is better, usually, uh, uh, unless you have everything in the one line. Uh, that doesn't mean it's good. Uh, but assuming that you follow some rules of uh, writing a, a software in a, a proper way, the less lines and better. So here we can see that SML is quite good if it comes to that because it's really declarative. So it's basically this, this chart shows what is the most declarative way of implementing the connection state machine. And uh, you see that uh, SML has a little boilerplate, so it's really good. Uh, other solutions are comparable. And the mm, state pattern actually requires the, the most code to, to satisfy that guy. So expressing what, not how, is good. Because the less lines we write, the maybe less bugs we will do. It's like there is a measure of how many bugs you do per line. Uh, 1,000 lines of code, so, so kind of good. Unless the library sucks. Then then that's not good. So declarative design is something I think we, we want in general, and that's the direction C++ is, I think, going. And zero overhead abstractions are, are good. Because it's like, even if we write five lines of code and uh, generate really bad uh, you know, performance out of it, that's semi-good one. So if we can combine both, I, I think that's great. So assembly lines, uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, comparing is like on a, a x86 assembly. And so it a bit depends, it will depend on the architecture, but uh, most of the solutions are kind of inline, so it won't differ that much. And assembly lines doesn't mean that it will be much faster, but it shows that if something is not optimized uh, well, in assembly code, it most likely won't be as fast, which we actually will confirm in a, in, in a few slides. And so we see that the state chart is a library which is not for the performance, if, 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 if you like. So uh, it's easy to express uh, stuff in, in it, but however, uh, it won't be your friend uh, if you care about the performance. We also see that uh, all the inline versions, uh, like SML, uh, Switch, and uh, if else, basically generated the same code, so we're on the same level. And, um, and others have some uh, more code to be which is generated, but as I pointed out, it doesn't mean anything yet. It means it's like you can you can get the gist that the state chart won't be as 
performing as well because it's like so much assembly. Uh, but the others, you don't know. Because MSM, for example, is a jump table, so it's a lot of line of code mm, generated, but it doesn't mean it will be performing very badly. So less assembly is a good sign, I would say. Uh, usually when you have stuff inlined, uh, as long as it's not, uh, you, you know, your cold path or something, that's good. However, it's extremely important to, to, to know and remember that not all assembly instructions are, are the same. So, for example, if, you, if you've seen that tons of assembly and that's vectorized, that might be much faster than having a few assembly lines sometimes. So we have to remember about that when we compare stuff. So what about the runtime performance? That's like, you know, the, the main thing which we want to compare uh, in that benchmark. So we see that, uh, as before, the inline versions are, are basically the same, uh, very fast. We also see that MSM, although generated more assembly lines, it's much faster than some other solutions. Uh, it's because of the assembly ID that you generated. It was jump table, so at runtime it didn't have to do a lot. Uh, state chart is slow, kind of expected. Uh, I wasn't surprised by <laughs> that. Uh, every uh, every solution which has some sort of allocations and heap usage won't be fast, right? It's like if you have to allocate in the hot path, uh, we're doing something wrong, and we won't get far. So we see that the core routines. Uh, the, the sort of inline, they, they're like in the middle, uh, are pretty distant as well. And the STL variant, that's the Clang version, not the GCC version, uh, is really distant as well. It actually compares to the uh, MSM. So I guess it was generating the jump table maybe. Or actually it's a bit faster even, so, so maybe it was like if else. I don't know exactly what libc++ implemented there by default. I know it's not the switch case though. So I think it's if else or jump table. Make sense? Good. So, so inlining is usually a good sign when we compare the runtime performance. Code bloat might be bad. So, uh, you know, inlining will produce more code, and especially if we inline our code path, uh, code paths all the time, well. That won't be the fastest solution possible, so we have to be aware of that. But there are tools which can improve uh, uh, that as well. So likely and unlikely in C++20, profile gather optimization, which is based on the data, and we run it, we run our application through, we collect which branches are you know hot, which are which are not, and then we recompile based on, based on that knowledge. Or we can use even a Bolt. Every, anyone can uh, use Bolt before? It's like Facebook uh, thing. So it's basically like profile guide optimization, but based on the binary. So they change the binary. Uh, that has, uh, it's still based on the perf uh, approach. So you collect the data, you feed the data into Bolt, and it will change your binary, which has uh, one interesting benefit that you can change the binary code of something which you don't own. Because if you have profile guided optimization, you have to have the code, right? Uh, with the bold, you don't. So you can change the third party library's uh, performance accordingly to what your data produced. So that's, that's quite neat. Uh, I advise you to try it out. And runtime performance depends on the architecture, as always. And Maybe a silly thing, but it's important not to try to verify the performance of debug builds. Uh, that doesn't really make much sense, and we have to use, you know, sort sort of, uh, you know, quite optimized flags to get the most out of awesome compilers we have. So in that case, I use O3. Uh, I specified the architecture which I was running. It it was Skylake. Uh, and also the link time optimization. I disable exceptions and disable the debug for, for variant and stuff. Make sense? So instructions per cycle uh, is yet another measure which we can check 
how well we utilize the CPU. So usually around two is good. If it's more than two, it means that we utilize it quite well. It's not really that a big measure of our application, but it's a good measure of, uh, of the CPU on its own. And we see that mo most solutions are quite on the same level, uh, more or less, uh, just the coroutines, not as much. So just to zoom it up, uh, instruction per cycle, so it shows uh, an average number of instructions executed for each cycle clock. And the higher the better. Uh, and two is a good sign. So if you, if you, you know, run call grind and you get the numbers and you see like two, that it means that your code is performing quite well. And it depends on the architecture. As I pointed out, it's more like architecture kind of uh, verification. Branches. Branches are interesting. Uh, as we see, jump table generated tons of branches. Uh, usually, we would say branches are bad, right? Because you know they will slow us down. Uh, but maybe not these days as much. So MSM has tons of branches, and other solutions have very little branches. And we've seen already that the inline versions for SML and Switch, although they have more branches, they were the best solutions if it comes to performance. So what does it mean? It means that it's better to avoid branches if you can. However, the branch predictor predictors are really good these days with learning patterns, and it not, not necessarily having a lot of branches uh, a bad thing, although most likely not a good thing either. But what is a bad thing is like when the branches you have lead into the branch misses. That's a bad thing. So if you have a lot of branches, however, you, you know, your branch predictor and your code always hit the one which are predicted, then we're good. If we usually miss them, well, we pay a lot. And we don't want to pay a lot because uh, that costs a lot. So you see that the state uh, pattern was performing not that well. And we see because of the branch misses, there are tons of branch misses, uh, because of the indirect calls with the virtual table and all this uh, code, which is not very well optimized. MSM, uh, on the other hand, uh, because of the jump table it was predicted very well. So the predictor has learned how to, how to deal with it. So it's on the same level as uh, switch SML in that regard. So that's interesting. So misprediction will affect the performance. So let's try to avoid it. Uh, cache misses also related kind of to that will have the negative performance impact. I didn't actually measure the cache misses uh, in in those examples, uh, but you can you, you can guess where where they where they will be because it's kind of the theme is uh, following that whenever we have uh, object oriented design with a lot of heap allocations and kind of Java ish approach, we paid a lot. What about the compilation times? Well. Here, the situation is different. So it's not always that you're the fastest, you will also compile the fastest. Mm. Usually, it's the other way around. So as you see, that's the reason why I started uh, dealing with MSM, because it just compiled so slowly. Uh, it's much slower than any other solution. Uh, and SML, for example, here, it's just, just a bit worse than the naive uh, switch and FL solution. So being on, on declarative, uh, having a declarative approach and being able to compile fast, it's something we can do in C++, modern C++. So that's fantastic. I think that's, like, that's the best thing which happened to C++. So what about the compilation times? Team P before C++11 will slow down your compilation time, for sure. Using MPL, boost MPL, and all the all three kind of uh, approaches won't be fast. However, on the bright side, 
with the C++ 11, 14, we can actually really speed it up with the variety templates and new mach machineries of MP11, for example, we, we can get much better performance. And sometimes, uh, not quite obvious, but when we have the TMP, we will have really long debug symbols, like gigabytes of uh, strings trying to, to point out the, uh, to the function names with the, all the templates. And they may really slow down the compilation times because uh, compilers usually com uh, compare them using strings. Uh, so sometimes it's very beneficial to remove the debug symbols uh, if you have really slow compilation times and if you don't have this, this space as well. So what about the compilation times in the release? Uh, MSM, still slow, didn't change much. Uh, other solutions actually get a bit faster, which is also interesting that uh, when we have the optimizations on, a lot of solutions which rely on, uh, on generating really you know, optimized code may compile faster because they, they just do less. They don't have to go through all of that. So sometimes optimization phases are faster than trying to be uh, generating all the code. So again, TMP in 98, but in 11, better. In 14, even better. In 17, even better. And in 20 as well. As I pointed out, turning on optimization sometimes may speed up your compilation times. So if you have slow compilation times and you use debug version with uh, uh, you know, optimizations turned off, it might, it might not be the fastest to compile for you. Might be, but it might not. What about executable size? So as I pointed out, uh, having long types is not necessarily good for your disk size, space, uh, and the FOMSM produces a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, huge binaries. Other solutions produce less, but you can also see that SML has a bit overhead here, uh, more than the switch and, and if else, because it's templated, so uh, it will produce some debug symbols uh, in the debug uh, version. In the release, it will be optimized, but in debug, uh, we'll have to pay. As I pointed out, it might be a gigabyte of data. So, yeah, I was working recently on a library which produces like 300 gigabytes debug symbols. Uh, not ideal. But, but you, you can eliminate them with like, if you have the tricks in which you create a, a struct inside your calls and you inherit, you can actually, you know, kind of do a type name erasure, and then uh, your compiler will produce a smaller type, especially in, in Clang. Or you can use the lambda trick when you have a lambda and unique type uh, instead of, you know, the long one. So, so there are ways of dealing with it, um, but usually it won't be ideal. So what about the executable size in the release mode? So here the situation is totally different, right? So debug symbols for MSM were the, the, the biggest, but it's not necessarily in the executable size for the release mode because, uh, because here the performance matters. So it will be inline, it will be removed, uh, and optimizers will uh, don't have to store the debug symbols. Uh, so you see it's like uh, there are just a few solutions which are not in sync with others, and that's basically the libraries and, uh, and the state pattern. However, uh, you, you can argue that usu usually the smaller the size, the better the performance. It's not usually the case, so it's not like one hundred percent rule, but uh, I've seen a lot of companies trying to you know, track the, the binary size or the executable size to, to verify as a simple verification of whether the performance will get worse or not. Uh, which is, you know, a tricky thing to do, in a sense. Uh, I wouldn't claim that, but it's usually 
uh, a case. And regarding that, it's like code layout may I have May, uh, may impact on performance. So if you add a function, for example, which is not even called, it's just a declaration, it may actually change your code layout and affect the performance of your code, although you never call it, because it won't be on the same uh, cache part when it was. It uh, could fit in the cache. Right now it doesn't, or it's on the edge on the cache. Uh, so yeah, it's extremely tricky to, to get the most out of the the code layer. But the main thing about the performance, we always you have to remember about the measuring it. That's the one thing. But it's also measuring the production like environment. Uh, I think that's like the main thing about the benchmarks. Because if you measure it in you know using our uh, silly environment on, on the laptop, uh, the results might be completely different than in the production like environment. So we may waste a lot of time. So we can get the indications, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily the proper results. So always measuring the production like environment if you want to get the most out of the benchmarks. Make sense? Everyone agree with that? And there's no silver bullet. Uh, unfortunately, we never know whether we will get the best performance using for example, the variant from Clang on GC. There's basically no ideal solution. So in my opinion, the best bet is just to keep all the options open and just provide the policies and let the users do, to do what they want with it and tweak it. So any questions regarding benchmarks? Yes, Arsa? Yeah, uh, your benchmarks are all a nice small example, which is very easy on the inline and the branch predictor. If you look into the benchmarks on larger state machines, it might defeat the inliner and the branch predictor to see if that changes. Right. The so between. yeah. So the question is whether uh, because the benchmarks were on the really silly example and uh, which can you know uh, be inlined, and whether I checked more complex examples, and I did. Uh, I did with not all the solutions. I didn't check that with if and else and switch, but I compared. Uh, boost libraries uh, in really huge state machines, like hundreds of events, hundreds of states, and they were showing basically the same results if it comes to the boost state machine, so that the SML was much faster, for example, depending on the policy. And that MSM is really fast as well because of the jump table generated compile time. However, uh, the benchmarks I did, I had to limit, I think, to 256 states because that was. Uh, the limit of the uh, gigabytes of memory I had for compiling the MSM, uh, which was 16. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I did that, but I didn't, that I didn't do that for all of the, the approaches. But it's a valid point, thank you. Another question? Did you look at different versions of GCC? Because I've looked at these um, jump tables being generated, and it depends on whether you use GCC um, can depend on whether you use boost MSM, uh, an MPL vector for your states, or you use Varadic templates. And the actual compiler itself will generate the, the code. In one case, it will generate the switch statement, and the other case, it will generate an if table, the, the else chain. And uh, you, you mean different versions of compilers can affect significantly affect the performance. Right. So the question and observation is that whether uh, that the different compilers and different versions of them may generate totally different code and optimize it differently. And the question following was whether I checked that. So I investigated the switch statement a lot uh, and how, you know, how even like how sparse the ideas are uh, may affect what is generated, whether it is branch table, you know, linear search, binary search, whatever, jump table as well. But, you know, I didn't do that for this use case uh, because it would like, like be too much uh, to, to present. However, I feel like I did my job by uh, letting users to write the policy they need to, to, to deal with it. Uh, but yeah, that's a really valid statement that always measure because you never know. It depends on your compiler, flags, architecture, environment. You never know. So you have to be 
careful about it. So just to sum up, because we have like five seconds, state machines are expressive way to rep represent the application flow. And I believe that they are much better than uh, using you know, naive solutions which are not maintainable in the long term. There are different ways of implementing state machines. There are different libraries. And all of them have different trades off. We can use coroutines. We can use libraries. We can use variant, depending on the use case, as always. There's no bullet, uh, you know, silver bullet here as well. And state machines are just more than simple transitions. As I pointed out, the system example, uh, if you really want to use the state machines in the declarative way, we probably have to use the, uh, a framework or a library to, to take the advantage of all of them, all the features. And leveraging zero cost libraries can boost our design and our performance. Uh, for example, by using policies. So all of that, I think it's good. So just to sum up, let's embrace zero state machines libraries. And if you're interested in benchmarks, then online you can just dig in uh, and, and check them out. So thank you. And if there are any questions. <laughs> if not. Uh, on the question, sorry. Uh, what's the status of the SML right as far as like the proposed good? No, it, uh, the the SML library hasn't been propo proposed to boost yet. Is there an intent? Proposed? Yeah, there is intent. Well, what do you, do you have like a timeline or anything? You know, you want to be a review manager? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right, that, that's the, usually the main thing with the boost. But yeah, there is an intent. It, it's, it's following the boost concept, uh, the namespace and everything. So if I find the review measure, then I will produce it. Produce, yeah. Move it on. Michael? We can find a review manager. Ah, we find a review manager, so yeah. Are you proposing? <laughs> OK, well, fantastic. Thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. What's the status, status with MSBC? Seven. MSBC? It does compile with MSBC. It took way longer than I expect, but yeah. Yes? All right, so to rephrase the, well, my understanding of it, it's that you found the observation is that with the procedural code, when you go back after a while, you can kind of understand after a while what you've done. With the state machines, not necessarily as easily. That, that, that's the first statement. Yes. Uh, so, well, I personally, I didn't find myself in that situation. Uh, uh, there's a better answer? Yeah. Go for it. When you go back to the code, do you have a handy state machine diagram for reference that helps you relearn the state? So are you trying to re reverse engineer the state machine diagram that would have been in your head to so the code? Basically, my code looks like these DSLs, but within four slashes in front of all the lines. Right. So, so in my opinion, it's like usually in my experience, having the diagrams and coming back to the declarative way of uh, thinking when you have the declarative state machine, it's quite easy. For me, it's much harder to get to the procedural code because I don't know when the transitions happen. So I have to follow it through uh, by you know, having multiple files, multiple functions, and then, oh, there is a transition to that state. Oh, wow, yeah. So it's really difficult for me to, to reason about it. When I see a DSL up front in front of me, and I see all the transitions and all the actions and everything is kind of abstract, uh, I find it much easier to, to, to reason about it. There's a comment from Michael. Yeah, I just, um, so I like to look at state tables with MSM as opposed to the UML part. Um, so for me, it was easier to come back to projects. I'd come back to projects years, years later and looked at the table and said, oh, 
kind of I kind of got it, you know, and, and worked out from that table what's going on. But with the plant UML output that you do with SML, it's amazing, right? You have the state machine, you just feed it into this thing, and then you you have a diagram in front of you with all the state transitions right. in UML, and yeah, there's no forgetting that definitely like oh oh yeah I remember that. Yeah. Right. So so the comment is like if you can see the UML diagram, you basically have no excuses not to understand what you actually did before, basically, right? Any questions? Huh? Thank you again. <laughs>